Like any programming language, the shell allows us to create functions, and we do so with the built-in command function. Function expects as its first argument the name of the function you are defining, followed by a pair of curly braces inside which is a command list, which is the body which gets invoked when we invoke the function. So here, for example, we define a function which we give the name foo, and then it has a body of two commands, first invoking ls, and then the built-in cd. And we should note that because the command list is delimited by curly braces, we can then actually spread the commands of the command list onto multiple lines. So we don't have to write a function all on just one line. We can write the same function like so. And because the space at the front of the line is basically ignored, we can indent it how we like. So sensibly, you would probably indent it like this. Once we've defined the function, we can then invoke it like any other command. You start the command with the name of that command, in this case, the name of the function. The question then arises, what happens with name collisions between function names and the names of built-in commands and also of regular programs, of process commands? Well, the answer is that the shell basically has an order of precedence. When it sees a command name with no slashes in it, it first assumes that that name refers to a function, but if there is no function of that name, it then checks to see if it's the name of built-in command, and finally failing that, then the shell will look in the directories of the path to see if it can find the executable of that name. So just understand that functions take precedence. If we were to define a function and called it cd, then any time we try to invoke the built-in cd command, instead we would be invoking the function which we have defined. And while we're on the subject of namespaces, I should mention that functions and variables live in separate namespaces. So if we have a variable named foo, we can also have a function named foo, and there's no interference there. They live in separate namespaces. Now, when we define a function, we don't specify any names for parameters that function expects to receive. Instead, arguments passed to a function are always assigned to the special parameter names 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so forth. So in the body of a function, we get the first argument value with the syntax $1, and the value of the second argument with $2, and the third with $3, and so forth. So here, this function foo its body consists of two commands. First, cd with an argument of $2. That is the value of the second argument passed to foo. And then the second command here, ls, has a single argument, which is the value of the first argument to the function. So in the next line, when we invoke this function, the first argument is slash bin, and the second is slash home. So what this function will do is first change the current working directory to slash home, and then list the contents of the slash bin directory. When we invoke a function, the exit status of that invocation is normally the exit status of the last command executed within the function. With the built-in return command, however, we can explicitly return a value from a function and also cause execution to leave a function early. So just like in Python or JavaScript, a return statement may be encountered before the very end of the function, but when encountered, a return causes execution to leave the function. This example function does nothing except invoke the return built-in to explicitly return the value 3. Notice in this last line, however, we're using the special variable expansion $question mark, which expands into the exit status of the previously executed command. So here we invoke foo, and that returns the value 3. So in the next line, the expansion $question mark expands into the value 3. So far, we've discussed variable expansion, but there are a number of other kinds of expansion, including what's called brace expansion. An argument that uses brace expansion contains a pair of curly braces not preceded by a dollar sign, because if the dollar sign were there, this would be a variable expansion, not a brace expansion. Inside these curly braces, you have a comma-separated list, and then before the braces, you optionally have a preamble, and afterwards a postscript. So consider this example, say we have an argument that reads foo, curly brace, apple, comma, banana, and curly brace, bar. What this expands into is foo, apple, bar, space, foo, banana, bar. So what happens in the brace expansion is that each item separated by commas in the curly braces, that gets surrounded by the preamble and postscript, and then the values produced from this expansion are separated by spaces. So the second example here has a comma-separated list of 35, comma, 14, comma, high, with a postscript of bar, and notice it has no preamble. So implicitly, the preamble is just an empty string. So what we end up with is three items, 35 bar, space, 14 bar, space, high bar. 
Now, those are just simple examples of brace expansion. There are a few other things you can do, which I won't get into. But the question is, when would this ever be useful? And the answer is that with some commands, you end up writing a string of arguments that are all very similar, but for small differences. And so with brace expansion, we can express that in a more convenient way. Like, for example, say two of our arguments are file paths that are exactly the same, but for one change. So here we write slash user slash local slash source slash bash slash, and then in curly braces, comma separated old and new, what we end up with then are two separate arguments, both the same, except for the last component of the path. Another kind of expansion is called tilde expansion. I mentioned in passing that tilde in the shell is used as a shorthand for your home directory. So what actually happens is that when the shell sees a tilde in the arguments to a command, it expands that tilde into whatever your home directory path is. So on my system, for example, my home directory is slash home slash Brian, so tilde would expand into slash home slash Brian. If I were to write an argument tilde slash foo, again, the shell will expand that tilde into slash home slash Brian, so it'd end up with slash home slash Brian slash foo. The shell also has a powerful feature called command substitution. The idea here is that a command is invoked, and whatever that command writes to standard out, that data gets inserted where the command substitution is placed. And there are two syntaxes for this. The first encloses the command in a pair of parentheses preceded by a dollar sign. The second encloses a command in backticks. Backtick is the character on the same key as the tilde on American keyboards. So, for example, if I write dollar sign paren echo space foo and paren, the echo command here writes foo to standard output, so that text is what gets inserted in place of this command substitution. The output gets substituted in place of the command. And alternatively here, we can get the same effect by writing the same thing except enclosing the command in backticks. The downside to this backtick form is that because it uses the same character as the start delimiter and end delimiter, that means you can't nest command substitutions with the syntax. Anytime you wish to nest command substitutions, you have to use the dollar sign paren syntax. So here, for example, we're attempting nested command substitutions, and in the top example, we're properly using the dollar sign paren syntax. So what actually happens here is first the interior command substitution command runs, echo bar, and so first bar is substituted in place of that command substitution, and then the outer command substitution is performed, invoking echo with the arguments foo and bar, so foo space bar gets inserted in place of that command substitution. When we try this with backticks, we don't get the same effect, because what's really going on here is that the first command substitution runs from the first backtick character to the second one, the second backtick preceding the second echo, and then at the end of this line, we have another pair of backticks indicating a command substitution with no command inside, which effectively just returns the null string. In fact, this means that the second echo isn't really a command, it's just argument text. So what happens here is the first command substitution is the command echo with an argument foo, so the text foo gets substituted in its place, leaving us with foo echo space bar. So the lesson here again is when you do wish to do nested command substitutions, don't use the back ticks. That will end up producing a result you probably don't intend. Another useful kind of substitution is called arithmetic substitution. An arithmetic substitution is written with a dollar sign and two pairs of parens in which we place an arithmetic expression, which gets evaluated, and the result of that evaluation is what gets substituted as the text. So in the first example here, the arithmetic substitution has an expression 3 plus 5. The shell evaluates that and returns this text 8. In the second example, the expression first adds 3 plus 5 together, getting us 8. And then that's multiplied by 2, getting us 16, so the text returned is 1, 6. Very handily, we can do variable substitutions inside arithmetic substitutions. So here, for example, we assign the value 7 to the variable foo, and then in a subsequent arithmetic substitution, we can expand the variable foo to get its current value, which is then here added to 3, resulting in the text 1, 0. One more kind of expansion is called file name expansion. If in an argument you see the special characters asterisk or question mark, or if you see both, 
That argument is expanded into the matching file or directory names, where the asterisk is used to match a run of zero or more characters, while the question mark is used to match a single character. So for example, if I write as argument foo asterisk bar, the shell will look in its current working directory for matches, and any file or directory which matches that pattern gets included in the expansion. So imagine, say, we have a file called foo3bar, well that matches, or foo asdf asdf bar, that also matches because the asterisk will match any number of characters. And lastly, foobar will match because the asterisk will match against the absence of any character. In the same directory, however, if you were to write foo question mark bar, that would only match against foo 3 bar because foo sdf sdf, that's multiple characters in between the foo and bar, and foo bar will not match because there has to be one character to match the question mark. You can't have the absence of any character. As this last example illustrates, the asterisk doesn't have to go in the middle of text, it can also go at the front or at the end. So here foo asterisk will match all of the same things as foo asterisk bar, except it will also match foo ack. It effectively matches anything that begins with foo. So again, in all of these examples, the shell is searching for matching file names or directory names in the current working directory, but if we were to precede the argument with a slash, then the shell would try and match the argument against absolute paths. So that's covered most, if not all, of the mechanisms of expansion and substitution that the shell offers. I alighted over some features that, while potentially in some cases useful, are really quite ugly in their details, and so kind of, kind of a headache to think about. One last thing, though, that can be useful to know is the order in which the shell will perform these expansions and substitutions. The general order is first it does brace expansions, then it will do tilde expansions, and then third it will do at the same level of precedence variable expansions, arithmetic expansions, and command substitutions. So really what that means is it matters which is inside which, which is the most interior, because just like with expressions, uh, they're evaluated inside out. And then lastly, only after doing all that other stuff, will the shell do file name expansions. So keeping this order in mind can help you understand commands that make a complicated use of these expansions and substitutions. Lastly, there is the question of when will the shell do expansion or substitution upon the result of my expansions or substitution. So the question is then, does the shell do a file name expansion on the result of that variable expansion? Also, you'll find there are quite complicated rules about certain contexts in which expansions and substitutions are not performed like they otherwise normally are. To be perfectly honest, I'm not totally clear on all those rules myself, and it's because of all these complications with expansions and substitutions that I consider the shell to really be quite an ugly language. In any case, if you wish to read up on this stuff, the place to look is the GNU Bash Manual.